Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Integrated Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Hélène Langevin. I'm the director of the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. And I have the pleasure to introduce uh, today's presenters uh, that are from the uh, Cheng Sui Integrated Health Center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Um, our presenters are Dr. Aditi Narurkar, who's the medical director of the Chen Sui Center, and uh, Wenfei Xie, who is a licensed acupuncturist, also at the center. I want to please I want to remind you uh, that if you have not signed in on the way in, please do so on the way out. And there's going to be a coffee hour immediately after the presentation in the ENT lounge right across the hall. Uh, and um, also, um, there's going to be a, an importantly a question answer period uh, at the end of the presentation for uh, the audience, uh, please me make sure you use the microphones because this presentation is being recorded and we want to make sure that uh, we capture everything you say on the tape. Dr. Narukar. Thanks so much for inviting us to present. Um, Cheng Sui Integrated Health Center is definitely the new kid on the block in the integrative medicine community in Boston. Um, I was a fellow f in the integrative medicine program at the BI and Harvard, and so many of my mentors are in the audience, so it's a real pleasure to present to all of you. Um, we're gonna get started. This is the official Harvard disclosure slide, which states that neither the pre presenters nor the discussants have any conflicts of interest to report. And our objectives for the talk today are threefold. First, to introduce the Cheng Sui Integrated Health Center to you, um, our offerings, our model, which is slightly different from other centers in town. We'll also be presenting a clinical case, as has been done in the past. And at the end, we'll give you a brief overview of the state of the science that is pertinent to the clinical case. We are open to having questions during, if you'd like to interrupt us, if you'd like us to, if you'd like to hold your questions for the question answer period, either works. And so we begin by telling you a little bit about the Cheng Sui Integrated Health Center at BIDMC. It's a relatively new model in integrative medicine in that we are embedded within the primary care practice at BIDMC. So it's one of the first integrative medicine centers that offers our services part and parcel of primary care. Um, our um, practice at the BI has about 40,000 patients. Um, that is the primary care practice at the BI. And so um, we offer all of our services in the same exam rooms as all of uh, the doctors who are practicing. We have three sites, one here at the Longwood campus at the BI across the street. The second is at the BIDMC Cancer Center in Needham. And the third is at the BIDMC um, offices in Chestnut Hill Square. We are fully integrated in the BI system, it, both um, in terms of where we practice geographically, but also in the electronic medical record. We have um, ordering and referrals right in there with ordering for orthopedics or cardiology, and our providers have been trained on how to document in the medical chart and loop back to the referring physician. So we like to think of us as a true integration of integrative medicine. We offer acupuncture, tai chi, yoga, meditation in the form of MBSR, and massage therapy. We also offer consultations by integrative medicine physicians in stress management, integrative medicine, and mind-body medicine. We can talk a lot more if you are interested about um, our approach and how we do things um, towards the end after we discuss the case. And so now on to the case. We are very honored to have our patient present with us today, and um, we'll bring her out um, in just a little bit. So um, this patient presented to me for an integrative medicine evaluation and a stress management evaluation with the chief complaint of trouble sleeping well and a sense of increased stress. So on the surface, very common things that we often see, not just in primary care, but in integrative medicine and all of the specialties. You know, doctor, I'm having some difficulty sleeping. I feel a lot of stress. Her primary care doctor, who is part of the BI network, referred her to see us after um, having discussed this with the patient for many months. Um, She's a 60-year-old female. Her PCP is Dr. Susan Frankel, and she presented in October 2014 for chronic insomnia and stress reduction for an integrative medicine evaluation. 
She reports a long-standing history of insomnia, sleep fragmentation, and early morning awakening. She has difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. She typically can fall asleep at relatively well compared to staying asleep. She wakes up any any time between three to five, and then again falls asleep again, and and then wakes up several hours later. She describes her sleep quality as so-so and her sleep quantity as not enough like so many of us. Um, bedtime is typically 10.30 to 11, and she wakes up, um, notwithstanding the, the sleep fragmentation in the middle of there, um, around 6 to 8 a.m. So when she presented initially to me in October 2014, her main goal of therapy was that she was interested in a non-pharmacological approach to manage her symptoms and to delay the initiation of hypnotic medications. She's been on several medications in the past, um, had a, a few year washout period, and was interested in trying to stretch that washout period as long as pos possible and to maintain um, her, her quality of life by, by improving her stress and decreasing her insomnia and she had never been to an integrative medicine uh, physician before and she was interested in our approach in the initial assessment of an integrative medicine physician we focus a lot on lifestyle medicine prevention and also on the main stressors that the patient reports so she had several stressors one was recent retirement from the workforce she also stated that um, she had an increased amount of unstructured time um, Believe it or not, of all of the patients I see, I have such a large proportion of patients who come to me immediately after they retire. Um, they have been waiting for retirement their whole life. They think this is going to be the golden era, and they retire, and within a month, they're crying in my office saying, I don't know what to do. I have such a loss of identity. So this is not new or surprising at all. As a physician, we see this very often. Um, she also cares for her son with autism, um, which has been a longstanding stressor of hers that she's um, coped with very well. And she has a prior history of anxiety and panic attacks, and we'll talk a little bit more about her history in just a second. Any questions about the patient or any other details that you'd like me to cover before we continue? So her past medical history is significant for longstanding insomnia, approximately 30, 20 to 30 years of insomnia that has come off and on in flares and waves, I would say. She has a history of depression and anxiety, panic disorder, vitamin D deficiency, osteoporosis, HPV and cervical polyps in the past. She has um, a surg uh, past surgical history with minor procedures, tonsillectomy, inguinal hernia repair, a resection of a mandibular mass, and several orthopedic surgeries, the resection of a humeral spur, and repair of a patellar fracture. Her family history is significant for a mother with hypertension and osteoarthritis. Her mother is alive and she's 89 years old. Her father um, passed away at age 87 due to a head trauma. He had coronary artery, artery disease and prostate cancer. Her son has autism. Um, in integrative medicine, we spent quite a bit of time on the social history, so this is slide one of two. She is married for 23 years. She has three children. She was a smoker in the past and quit 25 years ago. She drinks about one to two glasses of wine in the evenings. And on further questioning about her social history, she exercises quite regularly. She has a gym membership, tries to attend four to five times a week. She has a personal trainer a couple of times a week. Her diet is quite good, a minimal intake of processed foods, dairy, and refined carbohydrates. She eats mostly lean meats, vegetables, eggs, and fruit. She reports a very good relationship with her husband and her children. Her son with autism lives in upstate New York in an assisted living facility. Um, as far as other relations with her family members, she notes that they are sporadic. Um, she states that she has few close friends, but many acquaintances, and a sense of a suboptimal sense of community, which um, seems to have been exacerbated as a result of her retirement and increased free time now. At the time of her initial consul consultation in October 2014, she was on Pepsid and Claritin, um, two medicines that we see 
very often in primary care. And um, we'll talk more about the new medications that were, that were initiated by her PCP, but in May 2015, she was initiated on melatonin and Ambien on an as-needed basis um, for her insomnia. In the past, she has a long-standing history of anxiety, depression, and um, a brief bout of panic disorder. Um, she was on Zoloft and Wellbutrin and did well on those medications, and then in 2013 um, chose to discontinue them, and, were, and she was tapered off, monitored by her primary care doctor. And in the remote past, she was on Xanax, but hasn't been so for um, several decades. She has an allergy to erythromycin. So on review of systems, she has no constitutional, respiratory, cardiac, GI, GU, musculoskeletal, or neurologic symptoms. She occasionally notes dry eyes, episodic anxious thoughts, occasional low mood, and frequent sleep fragmentation. On physical exam, her vital signs are stable. HE and T exam is non-focal. Chest and cardiovascular exam is also within normal limits, as well as her abdomen. On musculoskeletal exam, she has mild post-surgical pain in the right shoulder after her humeral spur uh, repair. Neurologic and psychiatric exams are within normal limits as well. Again, something that we see very often um, if this patient presented to primary care, you know, there, there isn't anything, no focal deficits on physical exam, just um, some other things in lifestyle, which often, as we know, primary care doctors don't have a lot of time to get into, um, and the, the benefit of having a dedicated visit for integrative medicine is that we can really delve into some of these issues that in um, conventional medicine don't get enough airtime. So on reviewing her blood work, uh, CBC, Chem7, TSH, LFTs, lipids, vitamin D, parathyroid hormone, all within normal limits. She's had an extensive workup in the past for organic etiologies of her symptoms of, of her insomnia, um, and her results have come back excellent. So at the time of her integrative medicine physician visit, um, with every patient that, that we see and in, in, with physician consults, we do the perceived stress score, which is a validated instrument, 10 questions given to each patient at the start of the visit, and that's the metric that we use to gauge um, how well patients are doing. And the way I describe it to patients is that if you had high blood pressure, we'd be checking a number and adjusting and titrating the dosage of medication appropriately. So what we do in the in, the, in terms of how we approach a patient is we use this score to titrate or dose adjust meditation or whether or not the patient needs certain mind-body therapies or other um, modalities in integrative medicine. She scored a 17, which puts her in the moderately stressed category. National age-adjusted averages for this particular patient, 13.9 was considered normal, so she's in the moderately stressed category. Um, and at the time of her initial visit, um, we, we did an experiential session on mindfulness meditation, diaphragmatic breathing, and the 478 breathing technique. The goal was that mindfulness meditation would be done for five minutes twice a day initially and could be increased every three months to 10 minutes twice a day and, and very gradually. Um, what I like to tell patients is that meditation and medication, the difference is one letter. And so people, when they come to see me, they often want to learn how to meditate and start you know, an hour twice a day because they hear it's great. But it's a very powerful tool and it's not something to be taken lightly. So you have to start small and go and titrate up very slowly. And so patients really um, like that approach. And she decided to do five minutes twice a day as prescribed. And the diaphragmatic breathing was whenever she felt anxious. And the 478 breathing technique was used at nighttime for um, you know, nighttime awakenings. I should also mention here that this patient, while she is part of the um, BI network, um, her PCP had seen her several months prior, and then what, after I saw her, there were several months that she tried these therapies, which we'll get, get into of how she responded, and then her PCP didn't see her for six or so months, so we'll talk a little bit more about that and what happened um, as she began to do these sessions. 
So in conclusion, this is a 60-year-old female with a history of anxiety, depression, panic disorder, presenting for an integrative medicine consultation for long-standing insomnia and chronic stress. So the plan for her was first meditation, um, some sort of mind-body technique. Um, she was amenable to meditation, and we always try to use a patient-centered approach. Um, you know, one option is to have a group class of, but, but she um, wanted to learn how to meditate on her own. So five minutes twice a day with the hope that in the future she would enroll in the MBSR program through the Cheng Sui Integrated Health Center. Um, we also um, did some relaxation training, as I said, diaphragmatic breathing as needed for anxiety and the 478 breathing technique for um, nighttime awakenings and insomnia as needed. Um, acupuncture was initiated at the, at the initial visit because the patient has used acupuncture in the past with very good benefits for her insomnia and wanted to use acupuncture again. Um, so guided by her preference, um, I referred her to acupuncture that is not Acupuncture is not necessarily, we do this on a you know, case by case basis, acupuncture is not necessarily what we say, okay, a patient with long standing insomnia, let's try acupuncture. The approach is often first trying relaxation techniques, meditation, some sort of mind body approach, um, yoga therapy. Um, the patient herself was very keen to start acupuncture and so um, we initiated that at the start. So now I will turn the um, podium over to our staff acupuncturist, Wenfei Shea. I want to briefly introduce her before she comes here to um, talk about the course of acupuncture treatment for this particular patient. Wenfei is a highly skilled acupuncturist, has been in practice for over 30 years, has taught at the New England School of Acupuncture and has her private practice in Brookline. She's been a tremendous asset to us at the center, um, sees any and all patients and and has just a unbelievable um, bedside manner. Often patients say that when they see Wenfei, they feel better even if she didn't put any needles in her. So um, I want to turn the mic over to Wenfei. Um, I see this patient uh, begin, um, beginning of uh, uh, November um, 2014. Um, she is a 60 years old uh, um, a uh, female, lovely lady, uh, Carlo. Uh, she come uh, referred by Dr. Naroka. Uh, the major com um, complaint is uh, insomnia, anxiety, and depression. Uh, it, it, the patient stated uh, she has been taking uh, medication for years. Um, she also has uh, dry eyes, constipation. Uh, the initial visit, the pulse is uh, deep, and the uh, tongue uh, is a uh, dedicated coating, and the tip is very red. Uh, pulse and the tongue, uh, those are the two main things that uh, Chinese medicine are looking into uh, for the diagnosis. So the initial diagnosis uh, was in deficiency. Um, I uh, like we uh, give her like about six treatment uh, uh, from uh, November uh, November to January once a week. We had uh, six uh, treatment. So we say um, in deficiency. Uh, it's not mean like uh, every patient has insomnia uh, is in deficiency. Sometimes uh, patient uh, could have a digestive system disorder also could cause uh, uh, insomnia. But this patient uh, uh, is based on her pulse symptoms and town uh, is in deficiency. Uh, why in deficiency? Um, that happened quite often uh, uh, to a patient uh, like a post menopause uh, because uh, uh, during uh, menopause uh, uh, the kidney essence declines, um, leading to kidney indeficiency. Um, in Chinese medicine, um, the woman started like age seven. The, uh, you uh, we call it a ten kui, and then the starting and age fourteen. That's uh, 
uh, the, the kidney is the strongster, and then the uh, the woman started a menstruation, be able uh, to in, uh, fertility, and then uh, at her age 49, and uh, it's uh, the kidney uh, essence is dry up, and then the uh, the uh, person started menopause, and then that's uh, kind of happen uh, naturally, and that's the kidney system is gradually kind of uh, uh, decrease uh, deficiency. And then um, that because the kidney deficiency, indeficiency, uh, the patient could have all different symptoms like uh, heart flashes, uh, insomnia, um, uh, anxious, uh, anxiety, all different things. And then because um, not be able to sleep at night, that could cause uh, even uh, more indeficiency because uh, according to Chinese medicine, day is young, night is in. You need to sleep well at night to nourish your in and that will help a balance, yin and yang balance. So if you not be able to sleep at the night, even you try to make up the daytime and sleep a few hours in a day, it doesn't do the same job as that like you be able to sleep at night. So because she not be able to sleep at night, that could cause even more in deficiency. So um, in also like uh, um, we'll talk about um, in deficiency is uh, like uh, uh, kidney uh, deficiency in Chinese medicine. Um, the person uh, people are uh, part of universe, so it's always connecting to the nature. Like we have the five element in Chinese medicine. Fire, earth, metal, water, uh, and the uh, wo wood. Water is uh, kidney. So when kidney is deficiency and you don't have enough water, and that will cause too much fire. In other words, is off balance. The patient have a, a lot of heat in the body. The heat it doesn't mean the temperature heat. It's uh, imbalance, in, but this one, say, indeficiency is kind of a deficiency heat. So you could have uh, insomnia and uh, night sweats uh, and uh, anxiety, restless, uh, all those symptoms are related to uh, deficiency heat. Here you see this. Uh, um, Five element circle, you and they are kind of uh, holding each other, balance each other. And the water is related is kidney, and the wood is liver, and the fire is heart, and the earth is spleen, and uh, the metal is lung. They uh, they nourish each other, they balance each other. So whenever one of the uh, system are uh, off balance that could affect uh, others. So for this patient particularly, we say is in deficiency, the kidney deficiency, so it's not enough water here, and that causing too much fire. Any questions about this <laughs> five element? <laughs> So because the um, diagnosis uh, is uh, in deficiency, so we kind of uh, focus on try to nourish the kidney, liver in, try to balance uh, the in deficiencies. So the acupuncture points uh, um, or use uh, um, some of like kidney meridian, uh, liver meridians, uh, heart meridian, because the heart is the fire, and that's because uh, the kidney uh, deficient caused uh, too much fire. And uh, pericardial meridians, uh, also center meridians, uh, spleen, spleen meridian, spleen six uh, is because that points are uh, it's a uh, um, three in meridians cross uh, each other on that point. That's also very commonly used uh, uh, for indeficiencies. 
and also use the in town and the ear points. Those um, are we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the in town points. This is the acupuncture model uh, showing all those uh, meridians uh, and acupuncture points. And uh, we have like uh, 12 major meridians and then also some of the extra uh, meridians. Uh, the most of the points we use for this patient are uh, the, in the feet, uh, in the legs, in the center, in the stomach area, and also in the arms, on the head. Uh, um, those are like uh, um, the kidney and liver, heart meridian going through. The in uh, the uh, the point I'm gonna talk about a little bit more is the um, the in town. Uh, this point uh, located the uh, in between eyeballs in the middle of here, and uh, it's very powerful points and uh, it relaxes the central nervous system, used for relief anxiety and insomnia. And then it's uh, the, this point is uh, um, very good for like uh, um, people have like uh, um, like the, the the monkey mind like uh, the uh, the nonstop emotion like treadmill emotion like uh, the mind to keep going like not be able to sleep uh, um, the. And also very well, uh, good use for like, uh, people if coming for acupuncture treatment, they are very nervous uh, about acupuncture treatment. Usually we'll put this point first and then kind of uh, relax the patient so to make other uh, treatment easier. Um, this is very commonly used uh, in acupuncture treatment. And another point is the kidney three. Uh, that's uh, the, the main thing we are trying to nourish it, uh, the uh, in and the kidney uh, in. This point in Chinese name uh, called Great Streams means like uh, it's very powerful to kind of uh, nourish the water uh, to kind of. Uh, give a, uh, the uh, strength uh, the water, and uh, it's a great source for nourish the in. This point is located uh, in the angle between the bone and the the, the tender, uh, the heel tender. Uh, that's also our uh, very uh, very common use uh, for in deficiency. Uh, these are the two points uh, uh, kind of want to talk about it. And the other is uh, um, so uh, each time the patient come in, I will check the pulse, look at the tongue again, and then talk to her like, so how uh, she feel after the, the treatment. So the treatment to usually adjust it each time uh, based on the, uh, uh, the pulse and tongue and also the patient uh, response. Um, but main, usually the main points, it's always used. Some of them maybe change a little bit, but most of the points it's always used. Um, this patient responds to the acupuncture treatment very well. Um, even after one treatment next week, she come and say like she slept you know, very well after the last acupuncture treatment. So, um, but um, we continue the treatment because uh, even you know one treatment that may improve the symptoms, but it doesn't mean that uh, you the body balance. Uh, so, and then the body is still off balance, uh, the symptom could come back. So uh, usually the goal is try to balance the system and then uh, I will kind of um, relieve the symptoms for further. So um, she continued the treatment and uh, 
for six treatment and then she was away and she had a grandchild so she <laughs> stopped for a while and then she come back I'm still uh, seeing her uh, right now and uh, now um, she is better it's not perfect but uh, um, she uh, still sometimes uh, experience some of the problems but definitely uh, it's a lot better than before and then uh, her tongue it's uh, much improved the tip is not as red and her symptoms is uh, improved the sleep well uh, better and uh, also she often uh, mentioned uh, her blood pressure is uh, a, a lot better than before the pulse hasn't, because uh, it varies, it's not significantly changed, um, but the, the tone has changed quite a bit. So something um, to note, the patient had one acupuncture treatment once a week for six weeks, then took a several month hiatus and then resumed. And um, she has had excellent adherence to once weekly acupuncture treatments since November 2014. Um, and so that's kind of remarkable considering how difficult adherence is um, for many of our patients that we see um, in primary care, in conventional medicine, in integrative medicine. She also, at the time of that initial visit with me, um, she learned some meditation techniques and relaxation techniques, and she also, when I spoke to her last month, stated that she's had excellent adherence to those techniques as well, particularly the meditation twice a day at home, and, and uh, has had significantly um, improved stress levels. So after that initial visit with uh, the integrative physician visit in October of 2014, she initiated acupuncture in November 2014 and was doing really well um, and in May of 2015 or perhaps April is when a lot of her um, insomnia it kind of flared again um, she also had some associated tearfulness and dysthymia so she presented to her PCP the, the NP who works in her PCP's office at that time they had an extensive discussion on her insomnia and her um, changes to her mood and at that time after a very careful and thorough examination, blood work, um, depression screening, which was negative. She was initiated. She was started on melatonin and Ambien. Um, if you recall, at the start of our presentation, we discussed that her goal of therapy to work with integrative to work with integrative medicine was to delay the onset of medication and try to use a non-pharmacologic approach. Um, and so she was given just you know five to ten tablets of Ambien on an as-needed basis to take if she needed it. She was very reluctant at the time of the PCP visit to to accept the prescription, but she did, and um, she was more open to starting melatonin. She then resumed acupuncture a, week, uh, a month after that PCP visit, and has now been going to Wenfei once a week um, since then up until now. So we are greatly honored to have our patient here today, um, Carol. I'll be bringing her up in just a second. I just want to um, let everyone know that when I spoke to her last month and said, would you be willing to do this? We'd love to have you. Um, she's traveling to Alaska at 5 p.m. today, and she is still here. Um, she came early, and she's here because she was really excited to talk to us about her experience. So I welcome Carol to um, talk a little bit about her experience with acupuncture and meditation and then what we'll do is at the end we have about 15 to 20 minutes of questions and then at that time um, Wenfei, Carol and I will all be up here and you can ask um, Carol, Wenfei and me additional questions if you so wish. So Carol, come on up. Um, at the outset I want to make one thing clear is that I had been prescribed the Ambien and the melatonin. I haven't taken it. They're all sitting in my medicine chest. Um, I was on Zoloft and Wellbutrin for almost 20 years. I have cyclical de major depressive disorder, I guess is the technical term. And um, I went, weaned myself off of it about two years ago and I was very determined to not take anything. And they sit there and on some nights when it's really tough, I want to take them and don't want to go there. Um, so I haven't taken any of it. So they're there. They've been prescribed, but they know that 
I'm not going to do it. Um, I'm a big fan of Wenfei because she's just been amazing and she is wonderful. Um, acupuncture, for me, I've been very receptive to it. It's worked wonders for me. Um, you do need to keep going because it's a cumulative effect. One treatment won't do it. Um, I started doing acupuncture mainly because I'm terrified of needles and thought this is a really good way to not be terrified of needles anymore. And, and I tell people that an acupuncture treatment is one of the most relaxing experiences you'll ever do when they look at me. I, I must be taking drugs in addition to going to acupuncture because how can you have all these needles sticking in you and have it be relaxing, but it really is. It's just an amazing experience to, to have the treatment, to see what it does for you. Um, I was worried about my blood pressure. I normally had low blood pressure for most of my life, or very good blood pressure. And then um, I started having, I guess they call it white coat blood pressure. I was seeing my doctor and I had shoulder surgery last year. And while I'm waiting for my surgery, I could see the monitor and my blood pressure was up like 150 over something. I'm thinking, oh my God. You know, this is terrible. I have parents who have heart disease. This is not some place I want to go. And like everything else, I really don't want to take medication for it. Um, and so the combination of meditation and acupuncture, it's down to 120 over 80, 118 over 75. I can't believe I now know all these numbers. Um, but it's, it's really, really been effective for me in doing that. I've been very good about the meditation. I'm not quite doing it five minutes twice a day. I've kind of altered it. I now meditate for 20 minutes once a day. And uh, I never miss a day. I've been sick, I still meditate. Um, for me, it's, it's a must. I have to do it. Um, even if I don't get to it until nine o'clock at night, it's still done. I've done it waiting for airplanes to take off. I've done it in driving in cars because that might be the only time I can sit. But it's become a vital part of my day. Um, and these, it's just been, you know, I'm really grateful for the center. Um, I think they do amazing work. And uh, particularly Wen Fei, she's terrific. And um, I, you know, I don't know if anybody has questions, there will be time for questions afterwards. So thank you. Thanks so much, Carol. So we had the um, personal reflections of Carol, and we want to, um, given that this is a Grand Rounds, um, we, we do need to spend a little bit of time talking about the evidence base. Um, the anecdotal um, stories are so much more powerful but yet, um, let's spend a few minutes just talking about the state of the science of acupuncture for insomnia, postmenopausal insomnia, and um, perimenopausal symptoms. So this was a one of the rare positive um, studies that we found um, in 2013. A small RCT done of 18 postmenopausal women, um, age 50 to 67, with a BMI less than 30. F FSH level over 30 and at least one year of amenorrhea. They had an official diagnosis of insomnia based on DSM-4 criteria. They were not actively using any antidepressants, hypnotics, or hormonal therapy. The two groups in the study were acupuncture and sham acupuncture. Over a five-week period, 10 sessions of acupuncture and sham acupuncture were conducted. And at the start of the study, all um, patients, all participants had a sleep study and several questionnaires done um, before and after um, the treatment period. So the results were positive and in the acupuncture group there were significantly lower scores on several of the questionnaires and improved stage four sleep on uh, polysomnography. So in conclusion the authors felt that acupuncture was effective in improving um, sleep quality and quality of life in postmenopausal women with insomnia. I was just given a five minute warning, so we'll move through this quickly. Um, 
This was a systematic review in sleep medicine in 2012 of 40 RCTs from English and Chinese databases, which I thought was interesting that they use Chinese databases as well. And um, they evaluated acupressure, auricular acupressure, and reflexology um, as monotherapy, as adjunct therapy, with and without uh, conventional care. And the results showed that there were, they were inconclusive. Um, no clear, definitive conclusion on the benefits of acupressure reflexology or auricular acupressure in insomnia. And this was not in postmenopausal women. This was in insomnia in general. Um, I'm happy to talk about the details of some of this evidence we're presenting um, later on. Um, this was a Cochrane review for acupuncture for insomnia. 33 trials were included, about 2,300 participants with insomnia over a wide age range, 15 to 98. The modality studied were needle acupuncture, electroacupuncture, acupressure, and magnetic acupressure. So the results were varied, but ultimately the evidence showed that um, it was inconclusive once again, not su sufficiently rigorous trials to support or refute the use of acupuncture in treating uh, insomnia, and the um, author suggested that larger high quality trials are required. Finally, acupuncture for perimenopausal symptoms. So this is more along the lines of vasomotor symptoms associated with perimenopause. Um, again, a Cochrane review done in 2014, four eligible studies. Um, they looked at relaxation techniques, biofeedback, electroacupuncture, several integrative therapies, and again concluded that there was insufficient evidence um, to show the effectiveness of any of the above techniques to treat uh, menopausal uh, vasomotor symptoms. So um, while we see that the evidence, um, for the most part, is inconclusive, um, Wenfei can probably attest to this, and certainly our patient today who um, gave her testimonial, that anecdotally, um, often we will see benefits with acupuncture with our patients. So um, of course we know that more trials are needed, more data is needed to really bring this into the forefront as a, a viable, um, always adjunct therapy to conventional care for um, insomnia. So wrapping this up, so we have time for the Q&A. In terms of an integrative approach to chronic stress and insomnia, um, we chose this case specifically not because of the complexity of the medical condition or the um, vast array of specialists involved. We chose this case because it is deceptively complex. We see, uh, we see patients like this all the time in primary care. They've had long-standing stress, long-standing insomnia, and often what we can do in the time constraints is prescribe some medication, perhaps refer patients to psychotherapy. We treat, we teach them sleep hygiene and, and um, send them on their way because it's not a life-threatening thing, chronic stress and insomnia. But it does affect quality of life, and um, I would argue that quality of life needs to become, um, rather than be considered a soft metric, um, it would be wonderful if it was considered a um, true metric that we use in conventional medicine. So um, chronic stress and insomnia is often a complex syndrome with multifactorial inputs. So we obviously need multifactorial approach to managing a problem like this or a syndrome like this, so to speak. Um, it requires a thorough understanding of the biopsychosocial model of care. Um, we attempt in integrative medicine and in conventional medicine both um, more than ever, we are focused on a patient-centered approach. So in this particular case, the patient was very keen to begin acupuncture early, so we initiated acupuncture, and she's had very good results and um, reports um, excellent adherence and is feeling well and, hasn't, and, and has continued to maintain her goal of therapy, which was to delay the onset of medication. Um, it's really important to discuss that um, we want to always deliver integrated care by, in a multidisciplinary team 
based approach. So including the PCP, any specialist, the integrative medicine physician and integrative medicine provider, as well as the patient as part of that team. In this particular case, we used relaxation training, meditation, acupuncture. She also continued to follow with her PCP and NP to discuss medication and psychotherapy. Um, but again, it's a case by case basis. And I think that's the beauty um, of integrative medicine is that we really look at the whole person, look at lifestyle, preferences, and um, devise a plan accordingly. So thank you so much for letting us tell you a little bit about our center and present a case. And um, we open up the floor for any questions. I'll ask Wenfei and Carol to come up um, and we'll all have a mic and we can answer any questions you have. So any questions for any of us? And if you could please um, just tell us who your question is directed to, if that is the case. Hi, I'd like to direct my question at Carol. And my name is Carol also. <laughs> and um, I'm a yoga therapist. And what I wanted to ask you about is the element of hydration as associated. You mentioned the kidney, you know, relations to the water element. And I know for myself, if I'm dehydrated or if I drink wine, which, you know, I, you mentioned wine at one point, that my insomnia can be exacerbated. And, you know, just don't know if there's any if you notice any connection between the two, hydration especially. I don't really pay it, is this on? I don't really pay attention to the amount of water I drink. I just, when I'm thirsty, I drink water sometimes. It's a lot, sometimes it's not so much. Um, I've noticed that drinking doesn't seem to affect my sleep one way or the other. I can sometimes sleep really well not having had anything to drink and then um, I can have more than my, you know, more than two glasses of wine on occasion and sleep like a baby. So I'm not finding any correlation. I've looked, I know the conventional wisdom is that alcohol will, is, can be disruptive and it probably is to some degree, but um, I can't say if I, you know, if I have a drink, I'm not going to sleep or if I don't, I will sleep better. Um, it's hit or miss, it, I haven't found anything. It's pretty random as my daughter would say. And um, I really probably should drink more water. <laughs> but I'll I'm working I'll on it. I'm working on it. I, I'm going to do the same. <laughs> Drinking more water is always good for somebody have ex uh, too much heat. Uh, so in deficiency, uh, as, as I said, is a uh, deficiency heat. Uh, so drinking water is, uh, is helpful. Yeah. And the conventional medicine approach, uh, hydration is always considered important for all, for many medical conditions with the exception of CHF, which we're not discussing here. Sapir Khalsa, Division of Sleep Medicine. I was just wondering, uh, did you do a full sleep history workup as usually is done in the sleep clinic? And the other thing I didn't see was cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, including the multi-component aspect, stimulus control, um, sleep hygiene. Great question. Sh um, Carol presented to me for an integrative medicine consult and her PCP, who's been working with her in the past, um, has talked to her a lot about um, sleep hygiene and um, in the past has likely done several assessments <coughs> along those lines. As far as CBT, her nurse practitioner in May 2015 when they met for that visit um, had discussed um, psychotherapy, CBT, and other approaches um, for not just the insomnia, but also because at that time she was having a flare of her perimenopausal symptoms. And just as a note, I did see the therapist that was recommended to me, so I am, I fact as I'm going to see her after I leave here. So I am seeing um, therapist weekly, in addition to that, and doing CBT. Some CBT, that's not her specialty. But I've been, quite honestly, I've been dealing with this so, for so long that I could probably teach a class in sleep hygiene and what to do when your thoughts are racing and all the techniques that you ought to do. Um, and I really, 
know it, sleep hygiene, sleep efficiency, I think they call it now. There's just, yeah, I'm very familiar with all of it, too. And find them helpful sometimes. Any more questions? We're happy to take them. Sorry, thank you. <coughs> um, one is, what's the difference between integrative medicine and functional medicine, as, for example, practiced at Visions? The other that I'm curious about, while well, you talked about history, and this is because I'm a holistic, integrative energy therapist, um, I'm wondering also about um, early childhood adverse effects, which, in my experience, can go on in their own ways, having integrated into the whole system affecting the system later on um, and you know whether that any of those the techniques that are now used in terms of clearing the body were so I'll address um, the first question in greater detail than the second um, integrative medicine is an umbrella term and um, the, the old terminology complementary and alternative medicine that term has now been replaced by integrative medicine with the hope that using that term integrative means that we use an evidence-based approach to actually bring those therapies into the mix of conventional care so we don't ever offer can you hear me? We, we don't ever um, suggest using any of these therapies in place of, rather, as alternative medicine, but rather in complement to, and more so taking a step further, saying integrated within the medical system, the conventional medical system, um, that, which is the model of care that we practice at Cheng Sui and most of um, the, the, the audience here that are integrative medicine practitioners practice as well. So that is integrative medicine in a nutshell. Um, if you ask everyone here who practices integrative medicine, the definitions will be different, nuanced, but overall, they, I think I'm seeing heads nod. I think most people would agree that that's a uh, pretty universal definition. And uh, of course, most of us, um, we have a shared mission to bring these therapies right there, part and parcel, shoulder to shoulder with conventional care. Um, as adjunct therapies. Um, speaking about the difference between integrative medicine and functional medicine. So functional medicine is a, is a modality or an approach used within the broader umbrella term of integrative medicine. It has its own approach, so they use the the, uh, from my limited knowledge of functional medicine, they use a matrix, um, and I think that your initial, that your second question of early childhood trauma points to that. They have a very detailed intake on the, the, the um, on um, those sorts of questions. They use the matrix and the five areas that they focus on. Uh, functional medicine physicians often um, in their approach to evaluating a patient, often conduct a battery of tests, blood work, and other things, um, and then devise a plan using nutraceuticals and other um, therapies as well. So it's a, um, it's, it's an arm uh, and a specific approach um, the Cleveland Clinic has um, partnered with um, a functional medicine group and now offers um, uh, functional medicine within the clinic. Am I right on that? Is it the Cleveland Clinic or is it the Mayo Clinic? It is the Cleveland Clinic, right? Um, and I think Mark Hyman is a real proponent of functional medicine and really the spokesperson um, nationally and internationally. We at our center do not in, um, include functional medicine. There is a, a very prominent functional medicine center here in Massachusetts, the Institute of Functional Medicine, um, uh, directed by Mark. Um, so we do not use uh, functional medicine, but we do in our initial physician assessment look at, um, I, I really actually like the approach, the matrix that they use, and so um, parts of that approach have been utilized in our physician assessments when we initially see a patient. As far as early childhood trauma goes, 
Right. So um, that requires a highly, highly skilled practitioner that has really focused um, their work on trauma. We spoke to our social work division at the BI and talked about our therapies, um, which, Helen, you were there for that. And one of the social workers said, would you ever conduct MBSR for trauma survivors? And our initial response was, I don't think so, only because our MBSR teacher isn't trained in trauma. So um, that's opening up, you know, uh, that's something that's very sensitive. There's an excellent trauma center in Brookline, which if we have a patient who has a history of trauma, we will refer patients to that trauma center because they're much more equipped to manage trauma of any sort in patients um, because we always want to do good for the patient um, and we try to cross-refer as often as possible in the spirit of integrative medicine. One more question. Can we do two more questions? Go ahead. Um, are these services all covered by insurance? And um, what is the way that uh, people are able to use their insurance for this uh, complementary medicine, integrative medicine? Great question. We go speak to all of the divisions of the BI and try to drum up um, interest in integrative medicine, and that's always the first question that all the physicians ask. Um, our services are um, out of pocket. However, we do provide letters of medical necessity. Many insurance companies um, partially or fully cover a variety of the services that we offer, and so um, patients use that approach. They also can use their F. SA, the flexible spending account, to pay for these services. And we have one final question. Hey, Carol, um, I know something about sleep disorders because I have sleep apnea. And I went to the sleep lab and, and uh, volunteered as a special program uh, at the Brigham to study this. Did you ever go through an evaluation in the sleep lab trying to determine if the, the, you could determine the reason for your insomnia? I haven't. Um, and I've actually, when I was living in California, I went to a sleep disorders clinic at Stanford Hospital, Stanford University Hospital. Um, and they did not require me to go to an overnight thing. Um, from what I've been able to gather is that's mainly for sleep apnea. They look for the breathing stuff and they want to give you one of those CPAP masks. And my husband did one of these and that seemed to be their focus. Um, I really have no desire to go through that. Um, I don't want to sleep with electrodes on my head. I have trouble sleeping now and the thought of trying to sleep with things on my head. I've, they're never going to get a read on me. I'm never going to sleep with that stuff on my head. Are you kidding? So um, I know why I don't sleep. There's physically, I'm in, knock wood, I'm in pretty good shape. I'm in, thankfully I'm in good health. There's nothing really going on with me outside of a brain that won't let me sleep when it's time to sleep. So th I really don't have any need for it. If it had suddenly come on me, you know, two years ago without the history that I have, I might have pressed my doctor to go to a sleep center to look into that particular aspect of it more deeply. But because Really, I took stock, and it's been over about 30 years that I've been dealing with insomnia. And I know it really well. So I really didn't see the need to put everybody through all of that. Um, my husband reports that I don't really snore. So um, and that's one of the things that they look for in apnea if you're a big snorer. And my husband has it, so I know what it sounds like, and I don't sound like him. So I'm good that way. I had the same problem in the sleep lab with all the wires <laughs> in my head. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much to our presenters and our patient. And I think, I think this Grand Rounds was a really great illustration of a way to, of, of really um, um, looking 
at a patient through different lenses, the lens of, of traditional Chinese medicine and the lens of conventional medicine so nicely blended. And it was really nice to, to hear those, those voices kind of echoing each other. Um, I, um, I want to, uh, first of all, remind you uh, about, so the, the coffee hour is, you can follow the signs, there's an easel right across the hall, turn right, and then it's right, uh, there's an easel indicating where, the, where it is, and please join us. And uh, the next Grand Rounds is Tuesday, September 1st, and the Grand Rounds is always the first Tuesday of every month, and it will be hosted by the Center for Metabolic Health and Bariatric Surgery at the Brigham here. Should be very interesting. Right. Thank you very much all for coming.